Hi everybody, this is the fourth uh, mini lecture of six today and I'm going to talk about pervasive usability. So what we talked about in the previous uh, lecture, the third one, is what is pervasive computing. In the second, we talked a little bit about how you do usability testing. Um, usability work is all about working out how usable a technology is. Um, the idea is that it doesn't matter how sophisticated or how clever the thing you design is, it doesn't mean anything if users don't understand it and they don't accept it. So a key part of designing is to make sure that users understand something and can accept it and interact with it in rewarding ways that help them uh, to do things in their lives. Now, a traditional way of working out how usable a technology is, is running usability tests. This is something that you did in the second session in the studio, and there was a little lecture about how to do that. Um, so just moving forwards, what we're going to look at now is some case studies of how you do usability work with pervasive computing. We're going to look first at SMS, which is um, a texting protocol that is still used, although it's not as ubiquitous as it used to be. So we can see here a pretty old phone now that supports SMS. And you can see kind of uh, text uh, abbreviations there. And the second thing we're going to look at is the classic iPod. And look at the usability of the classic iPod and how we think about that. Now, one of the key things that I want to introduce here is that there are two contrasting approaches to thinking about usability. Now, one is called usability in itself. Usability in itself means that the technology doesn't need to have any context. You can test the technology without real users, right? Without uh, people with any real motivation, and you can do it in any place without a real context. So in the second lecture, in the usability test, the idea was you would simply find a number of users to carry out a task, maybe in a classroom, with a technology. You can do that, but the technology may mean nothing much to users. They may never even use it very much. They may not be motivated to use it, apart from just doing you a favor by being in your usability study. Now, this is a kind of classic way of doing usability work, OK? Uh, it, and it has value, which I'll talk about in a minute. But it isn't to do with real users with real motivations. Now, usability in life is the opposite of that, if you like. It contrasts with us. Uh, with that, and it's how uh, computing works for us in our everyday life, in a real context, with real users, with real motivations. So if we want to find out about how usable an iPhone is, maybe if we take a usability in life approach, we actually shadow people in their real lives, follow them around, find out how they're using the phone, and what they're doing with the phone is because they want to be able to use it they're motivating the use of it, they're the real user, and they're using it in their real context of their lives. Okay, So the question that arises then, uh, what's so important about this? Why uh, would thinking about usability in life add anything to understanding usability? And that is what I'm going to talk about in this little lecture. So as you saw in the uh, second presentation, um, we often check out the usability of a technology in a lab with a defined task. So I gave examples about uh, adding a contact to an iPhone or finding the contacts uh, page on the Coventry University site. And what that's about is often concentrating on a particular aspect of an interface and checking out the usability just of that aspect. So how you add contacts, how you, uh, sorry, and how you find certain information on a website. So we can't test out everything, we're just testing out a little detail. Think about usability in itself, which is to run tests in labs to look at particular tasks, uh, is that it's artificial, right? Uh, it may not use real users, as I say, and, it may, and those users may not have any real reason for using the technology other than you've asked them to do it for the purposes of a test. Now, the important thing about this is that usability tests get at what's called cognitive universals. 
Cognition means mental processing, processing of information. Uh, there are some kinds of mental processing which are universal. They're not affected by age, they're not affected by nationality, they're not affected by sex, they are the same for everybody. Usability testing gets at cognitive universals, so how quickly you can see something, how quickly you can press something, how quickly you can link two events together and work out how to move to the next event, all about information processing and perception. So usability in itself is very good to get at those things. Now, because cognitive universals are not affected by context or by motivations, we don't need those things. Okay? So we can identify those cognitive universals, things like that affect completion times, that affect error rates. We can identify all of those things regardless of how authentic the testing situation is. And the situation can be completely artificial. We will still get our results on usability tests. So let's think about how we would check out SMS uh, for usability, okay? In a usability in itself context, in a lab setting, doing a traditional kind of usability test. Let's say we ask our users to copy a predefined text message and we measure how long it would take and how many errors they made, okay? So we can do that kind of study in labs, in classrooms, uh, in any setting, away from the real world. But the thing about pervasive computing is it's inherently part of the real world. It exists in the real world and can't be separated from the real world. So how do we establish the usability of a technology, not just in artificial situations in labs, but out in the real world? Uh, that's really quite a challenge. Using a device in the real world creates other kinds of issues and challenges to usability than lab-based testing. Also, if we're thinking about how usable something is in everyday life, we're not looking at small details, but the, the big picture. Does the whole thing work for people? Uh, can it work for multiple contexts? So let's think for a moment about a checkout in a supermarket. I'm sure you've seen these things, automated checkout. So what you do is take your uh, shopping to one of these things, scan the shopping through, put it in your shopping bag, and then pay for it, um, walk away, get your receipt and walk away. This technology is built into the real world, can't be separated from the real world, and it supports real people with real intentions. Okay, I'm using this thing because I wanna buy some food, that's part of my life. I'm gonna buy some dinner, cook it later, so that's why I'm there. I'm not there for a usability test. I'm there to achieve something. Now, we could put that thing in a lab, right? And we could run some usability studies on it. We could say to a user, um, you have uh, a bread roll, find the bread roll on the menu, say that you've got one and find out what the cost would be, right? However, if we're going to check this, how this thing works in real life for people, we need to know more than that. We need to know more about how it supports the entire activity of paying for your shopping. So if we're thinking about usability in life, we're thinking about an activity, an entire activity, how far that is supported. So we need to observe people going through the entire process. Is the entire process supported or not? What are the problems? So. Here we get away from the idea of artificially testing features of a technology to observing how the technology supports an entire activity. Now, pervasive computing is about supporting activities in everyday life, so it leads naturally into observational work to check out an entire process that somebody's going through for real reasons because it's part of their life. Now, here we have a... Um, ticket machine in a railway station. Here people can approach the machine and same thing, they can buy a ticket, okay? Now, we don't really have the option to do usability testing on that kind of technology. It's built into the world. Maybe we could put a prototype into a lab and try out some simple tests like, you know, buy a return from Coventry to Birmingham uh, that's leaving in one hour. But what we're really interested in is how does that technology work in the situation and does it really support people as they live their everyday lives? 
We can't get it into a lab, so what are some usability studies we could run in the real situation that would give us insight into how it really works for people in that setting? Uh, so, what would be the most important thing about a ticket machine, let's say, at rush hour? Why would people want to use a ticket machine? And the main thing is that people are in a hurry, right? They need to catch their train as fast as possible. They usually don't have much time. And people approach ticket machines and use them because possibly they think that's faster than the human service, possibly more efficient. So really, we want to find out, does a machine actually support people in a hurry? And is it a good alternative to the uh, human service? So perhaps what we could do is observe people buying tickets and compare that with the human service. So we compare how long it takes. We might compare expressions of frustration. Are people at the machine looking around because they don't understand how to do something? How many times do users actually abort the process because they can't understand it and then go and speak to a human being anyway to buy the ticket? And if people do abort and they are frustrated, what interface events are associated with that? So we've got a completely different level of analysis. We're not thinking about tasks out of context in labs. We're thinking about an entire activity and how we analyze that and see whether the technology really supports what people are trying to do as part of their real lives. Coming back to um, SMS, SMS means texting. Uh, you're constrained to a number of characters. Uh, you have a highly constrained typing method. You have to often abbreviate to get your words into the limit. Now, you can do usability in itself testing on SMS. So let's say you would uh, get people to type a message and you could compare it with how fast it takes to, to do the same message in a word processor. And you will find that the SMS is way, way slower and more difficult than traditional word processing. Okay? Not only that, SMS uh, gives you significant memory load. You have to remember where characters are. So your one key can stand for many different characters. You've got to know about that. Now, uh, if auto-texting, you've got to remember not to look at what you're typing, for example. So there's a lot more to remember than traditional texting. There's no error prevention, necessarily. So if we run usability in itself tests on SMS, and we want to look at how good SMS is, how usable it is, it looks like a disaster. But SMS is a major success, despite those usability problems. Now, why is that? Well, it's because it's usable in life. It's got a very quick, minimal interface. You can use it to, to, for all kinds of communications. It's great for keeping in touch. Importantly, you don't have to ring someone. You can just send them a message, so you're not interrupting them so much. Also, the person you're sending the message to has some time to think about it, and they don't have to respond immediately, unlike a phone call. SMS also works effectively. It links to network services reliably. So it's very robust. It's also cheap. Now, what that means is that even though technically SMS is a usability disaster, in terms of the way it supports our communications in everyday life, it's highly effective. And that is why it's become so successful. So we can think about usable, usability in life as getting at different issues, how it really works for people in their everyday activities. It means that something works in the world for people and the situations that we find ourselves in. And that can be counterintuitive. SMS is a great example of something really working for people in their everyday lives that if we put it in a lab setting and test it in labs, it looks like a disaster. Now, an iPod is a little bit different because, unlike SMS, it performs well in lab tests. So we can test it on things like the ability to navigate, the number of steps taken, and completion times. And that interface works really well, and we can show that in labs. But it's also usable in life for many of the same reasons as SMS. It's quick, it's easy single-handed, you've got a big bright screen, you've got a minimal interface, which there's less errors to make. Uh, arguably, the classic iPod uh, with a pinwheel is more usable than touchscreens, there's less to think about. It's also usable in life because there's a pride of ownership. You think it's cool, so you interact with it, okay? And just interacting with it helps you to learn it as well. Now, usability in itself, that approach of 
doing abstract tasks in labs say nothing about those real life issues, or, or very little. Um, so we need to think about usability in life, how a technology works for real people with real motivations in real contexts. In the studio, you're going to be doing a little bit of reading to work out more about the distinction between usability in itself and usability in life. And these two different perspectives lead to different ways of doing usability studies. And we'll be saying more about that. Just some takeouts to finish this little lecture. Pervasive computing is computing for everyday life. Uh, it's often connected into the environment and it's linked to your activities as a real person with real motivations. Usability in itself as an approach looks at devices away from that real world context and uses may not be real and there may be no real motivation for doing what a usability tester is uh, asking you to do. The thing is that pervasive computing is never away from a real context, a real location, uh, real motivations. Now, usability in itself is very important because it gets at cognitive universals. We must design things so that they are right in terms of cognitive universals. But we've also got to consider how technology works for people as part of their everyday life. And that is the point of the usability in life approach. So they look at two different things. Usability in itself is about abstract cognition. Usability in life is about how it supports you as a real person in real life. And we need to cover both of those things when we're thinking about usability. Okay, and that's the end of the uh, fourth lecture.